Hey folks, um, this is Graham Mitchell and today I want to talk to you about just the history of computing devices on the earth because I just think it's interesting. Uh, I think I should point out that you do not need to know this in order to be a better programmer. So if you don't know any of these things, don't panic. I just think it's interesting and it's always good to know your history. So we're going to start out way back in the day where we have fingers. Um, we have records from a really long time ago that people use their fingers and toes to count. Um, so there's a limit to how much you can keep in your brain when you're counting. And so this one is a is sort of the very first way that humans started to try to extend their ability outside of what their brain can keep track of to, to do mathematics. So um, the first piece of technology that I'm aware of where people used um, a machine, a mechanical device, I guess, if you want to think about it that way, to help themselves keep track of uh, arithmetic that was bigger than what they could do is the abacus. Um, getting a good date on this is difficult, but it appears that maybe the earliest ones come from about uh, 2000 in the uh, you know, uh, about 5,000 years ago in Sumeria, and they were used to do calculations for sums for trades and, and things like that. So if we go forward a few hundred, a few thousand years, we get to the idea of wax tablets. So by this point, people had figured out a way to write down mathematics. Okay, so the idea behind a wax tablet is you had a piece of wood, with some melted wax on it, and then you had a little stylus where you could scrape off the little um, your calculations, and then when you were done, you could scrape all those off to get a clean layer underneath, and then keep writing. So it was a reusable way of doing calculations uh, that you could show to other people, but then you could get a fresh one when you wanted it, and that was much better than using a scroll or um, or, you know, chiseling into something else because this was, could be a little more permanent, but yes, it could also be reusable. And then when the wax got too thin, you just melt the whole thing down, pour some fresh wax on it, wait for it to dry, and then you've got a fresh thing again. So that brings us to the Antikythera mechanism, um, which was discovered in a shipwreck. Um... We think it dates from about 100 years uh, before the Common Era, uh, maybe as much as 200, maybe as little as like 50. Um, seems to have originated from Greece. We're pretty certain about that. And this was an orrery, which was a device that was used to track the positions of um, celestial bodies, so the sun, the moon, the planets. So you could track when eclipses might be, you could track, you know, um, that kind of thing. Uh, astronomy stuff and this was a really fantastic mechanism because when it was first discovered people didn't know what it was because they said man there's no way that Greece uh, you know a hundred years before the common era had a machine that was complex enough to do this sort of thing because we didn't have the technology for that until much much later but it was examined um, with some cool x-ray technology to sort of look at all the under layers and we now know that it was um, had 37 gear wheels and was really a fantastic piece of machinery to help them do calculations to track that sort of thing. And I just think it's really cool. Um, so now we're going to skip a whole bunch of time because for a long time uh, the technology, so mathematics continued and a lot of people figured out new concepts but in terms of a machine to help them do their work there wasn't a whole lot for a long time until we get to John Napier. So John Napier was in Scotland. And in the 1600s, he developed logarithms, which were a fantastically useful piece of mathematics that allowed us to solve problems that had previously been unsolvable. Any kind of problem where there was a, a variable, an unknown in an exponent of some equation, and logarithms allowed us to solve this. So related to that, although not strictly using logarithms, he came up with this uh, grid called Napier's bones, and it was called that because they were bones were um, something that you could write on, and they were light, and they were relatively durable. And so he put these multiplication tables 
on these strips of bone and then carve them and put them in this wooden box. And so by arranging them in a certain way, you could do a large multiplication and division um, in a way that, that wasn't easy to do before. And instead of having to do a long division by hand, you could basically do it using his bones, which were, uh, which were super, super, super useful. So he invented logarithms, he published that, he, he released his bones, which were a cool deal. And then it didn't take very long for someone to improve on the concept. So just a couple years later, um, there was a guy named Edmund Gunter who in 1620 took Napier's concept of published logarithms and made a single ruler, just one ruler with a logarithmic scale, and then you would take just a regular ruler near it and then use that to do calculations. So that was in 1620. And then just two years later, uh, William Outred took two of those Gunter rules and basically put them together so that they could move and came up with something that's basically the equivalent of the modern slide rule. So the modern slide rule works by using logarithms and they allow people to relatively quickly do multiplication and division. They can do exponents, they can work out logarithms, um, they can even, even do some trigonometry on them. And so this is in the 1600s and this ended up being basically the best technology we had for doing general purpose calculations for hundreds of years after this. Uh, I actually own a slide rule. I don't know how to use it, but um, they were in common use even, even as late as the, the 1970s in the United States um, and all over the world. Okay, so a few years later, we have Pascal, Blaise Pascal, the theologian, the philosopher, mathematician. So he was the son of a tax collector, and he was always having to count up taxes and do math on it. And he was smart and he was lazy and said, hey, can I get a machine to do this for me? So he came up with this arithmetic machine, which basically could do addition and subtraction mechanically. And so you would just sort of turn the crank and it would you would turn the dials to say what you wanted to add and you would turn the crank and it would automatically add that amount to the other, including carrying results to other columns, which was a really... Um, sort of thing. The way it did subtraction is really cool. It uses this com concept called the nines complement, where basically the machine could only add, but you could use it to subtract by figuring out what number would you have to add to it so that it would wrap around. Like think about the odometer in your car. If it goes all the way around to all nines and then wraps around and goes back to zero again, so the nines complement is the number that you add to a number in order to get the same result after wrapping around that you would get when subtracting. So that was Pascal's arithmetic machine, sometimes called Pascal's calculator. Um, so that brings us a few years later to Leibniz's uh, stepped reckoner. Okay, so the stepped reckoner, he was, uh, well, I, I should point out, I put that this was invented in Hanover, Germany, because Leibniz was living in Hanover, Hanover at the time that he released it. But he, but Hanover wasn't part of Germany in 1694. It was its uh, a part of the Holy Roman Empire, just called the Electorate of Hanover. So if someone is from Hanover and is gonna like hate me in the comments because it's wrong, I do the, know the difference. So anyway. So he invented this around 1673. It was based on, he saw Pascal's machine and said, oh man, that's super cool. I wonder if I could create something similar that could multiply and divide as well, instead of just adding and subtracting. So um, he invented it in 1673, finally got a, a sort of fully fleshed out working version in 1694. This is a photo of a recreation from a museum. And uh, the, it used a, a step cylinder internally, something that was called a Leibniz wheel. And that was such a cool invention that other computing devices used it even for 200 years later. Um, and I love this quote by Leibniz. He says, It is beneath the dignity of excellent men to waste their time in calculation when any peasant could do the work just as accurately with the aid of a machine. And this is, this is sort of the concept of computing technology that even continues today.
we don't want machines to replace people. We want machines to do work for us so that we can do more interesting things. Instead of spending our time working out mathematical problems, we can focus on higher levels of thought and do things that humans can do well. And, and that, that continues in all this. All right, so that's 1694. So this is going to bring us to France uh, we, and Jacquard's loom. So Joseph Jacquard was a, a weaver. He used a loom to make uh, rugs and other things like that. And he is, I, incl I sort of hesitate to put him in here because he didn't exactly invent this, except he's the most famous. There were several other, three other Frenchmen during the previous 80 years that basically had this concept and refined it. But the whole idea was these punch cards. So he would take a piece of paper, he would punch holes in it, and then he would stitch the pieces of paper together so that they made this big belt. And then the belt would be fed into the machine, and the machine would put these little fingers in there through the holes, and if there was a hole, the finger would go through, and if there wasn't a hole, the finger would stop. And based on that, the machine could automatically move these arms around to weave these intricate patterns that they used to have to do by hand because for each one, they would have to reset everything and then cha-chunk do it. And then they would have to reset it again and go cha-chunk. And this way, the machine, you could just spend all your time working out the holes. And then once you got that done and got it all put together in a chain, then you could just put it on the machine and the machine could just do all the manipulation by itself. Um, and this is really a cool idea because not only does it allow them to create super complicated rugs in a repeatable way, but this idea of writing down instructions for a machine to follow by punching holes in a card was something that would be continued to be used for basically the next 200 years. Um, and so, like I say, he, he's probably the most famous one for this, and he had the most advanced machine. He got a patent, essentially, from France, basically saying that only he could make them and he could earn all the profits from them. But, um, but he was clearly inspired by several other people who did more foundational work in that, in that space. Okay, so I've been using the word calculator a lot in this, but I want to sort of emphasize, this is a, a, a bad quality photo, so sorry for that. But this is a book that was published in the 1800s. This is a, a book about how to make uh, ships, how to make boats, right? And uh, this, is, uh, this paragraph here says, we think it is an important question how much, when we're building a new ship, how many people should be employed as foremen, shipwrights, but would it be better to take some of them and employ them as calculators under their superintendent? So the word calculator was a job title. People worked as calculators, okay? So there was no device that was being used as a calculator. You got hired. If you could do math and you could do it accurately and relatively quickly, you could get hired as a calculator where people had things that needed figuring out and you would just basically work out math problems all day and do that. So the word calculator was a, like I say, it was a, it was a profession in the 1800s. So now let's talk about Charles Babbage. So Charles Babbage was an Englishman. Um, this is a, a recreation of his different engine, uh, and you'll see why in just a second. So um, he, again, wanted to make a, a general purpose calculating machine that could do polynomial functions. So a AX squared plus BX plus C um, to work out those kinds of problems. So this is just more complicated than addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It could also do logarithms. It could estimate uh, trigonometric functions, so like sines and cosines and things like that. So he had this idea for a difference engine that could do these uh, pretty complicated math problems just by turning a crank um, and setting it up. So he constructed a relatively small one. He brought it and showed it to the British government and basically said, hey, I have this idea. Can you give me the money so that I can build the proper model? And they said, okay, here's, here's some money. We think this is a great idea. We want you to work out, you know, we have this a governmental need for certain tables. Here you go. Here's the money. And so, however, his design was too complicated for the ability of metal workers to make a hundred gears or a thousand gears that were all exactly the same size and shape. 
uh, at least economically. I mean, they could make them, but it, it was very expensive. So it took him 20 years. He went 10 times over his budget, and he never got it working. So the government basically said, Ugh, what a failure. You know, we, we never got the calculating machine that we wanted. And then during all this time, Babbage is like, man, I have this even better idea for a more advanced machine called the analytical engine that could do uh, even more complicated stuff. Um, and so he basically quit working on this and started working on the analytical engine, which also was never built. Um, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a really cool device. So while we're talking about the analytical engine, I want to take a brief break from talking about machines to talk about an extra person. So this is Ada Lovelace. Um, technically, her name is Augusta Ada King, the Countess of Lovelace. She was the only child of the poet Lord Byron. Um, so if you know Byron, that's, that's, this is her daughter, his daughter. However, Byron abandoned her and her mother a month after she was born. And her mother was super mad about it because Byron was pretty flaky and basically said, you know what, I am going to promote, my daughter is interested in mathematics, I'm going to make sure she has all the tutors she would ever want so that she can study mathematics and not developing the same insanity that her father suffers from, being a, a poet and a writer and, uh, you know, uh, a, a bad husband by all accounts. So this is Ada Lovelace. So Babbage was working on his analytical engine. He presented, he did a, a talk about it to this society. And then somebody had written a paper about it to basically say, hey, this is about uh, Babbage's analytical engine. And so Ada Lovelace was then brought in. She had been helping Babbage with this concept um, to, to translate it from the French that was written into English she corrected some errors along the way, and then she added at the end of her translation her own thoughts on the matter. And her, her notes, her footnotes at the end, were much longer than the original work, expanding on his ideas. And the thing that's really cool about her notes, now that we go back and look at them, she saw things in the analytical engine that even Babbage did not see. She saw, he's thinking of this as a machine that can be used to do calculations, that can do math problems for us. But she thought, hey, this thing can do procedures on numbers, but numbers don't have to mean quantities. Like the number five doesn't have to mean one, two, three, four, five things. It could also mean the fifth note in the scale, right? You could encode music some way in numbers, and then this machine could work with music or produce music in some way. Um, and so she expanded out all her ideas in there. She also included a sequence of instructions that said, hey, if we can ever build this machine and we can get it to work the way we think it can, these instructions would be able to use to calculate the Bernoulli numbers, which is a sequence of numbers, sort of like the prime numbers, uh, just sort of an interesting sequence of numbers that people who like maths think are, are cool. And... Um, and because she is the first person that we're aware of to write down a sequence of instructions that a machine will follow to produce a certain output, um, a general purpose calculating machine, then she is essentially considered the first computer programmer. And her, her rule of the Bernoulli numbers is, uh, is considered to be the first computer program. So it'll love Lace, brilliant, brilliant, fascinating person. So definitely read up more about her if you're interested at all. Okay, so that's kind of where we end briefly, where we have this analytical engine designed by Babbage, never built, that could theoretically mechanically calculate a whole lot of a general purpose computing device. But the technology wasn't there until we start to develop electronics. Okay, so um, actually let me flash forward a little bit. So when I was in school, the ENIAC was the first general purpose electronic computer. But it turns out that was wrong. It wasn't. And I didn't know it. In fact, I don't think in, hardly anybody knew it in the 1980s when I, was in, when I was in school. And that is because Carl Zeus um, developed this electronic computer. He was in Berlin in 1941. He had developed the Z1 and then 
uh, which was more mechanical, and then the Z2, and then finally this is the Z3. And the Z3 turns out to have been the first programmable general purpose digital computer. And what I mean by digital is it doesn't use gears and machinery to do its calculations. It does its calculation through electronics. You have electricity flowing through circuits of some kind and by how they flow through the circuit, there's different switches in there usually done by vacuum tubes or sometimes through physical things that you could, you know, wires that you could move around. They could perform general purpose calculations. So, any ideas why I had never heard of the Zeus Z3 until, you know, 10 years ago? Well, in 1941 in Germany, they were not uh, communicating with the West, right? And so all the science that I learned was based on what we knew about, and this was kind of a government secret, and, uh, and this was also destroyed in the Allied bombing raids um, in World War II. And so we basically didn't know about it in the rest of the world for, for quite a long time, which is a shame because this is a really brilliant machine. Um, and the, the instructions for the computer to follow were, were put on punched film, so the same idea of punching holes in a film that then, then the computer could follow. Okay, so now let's bring us back forward to ENIAC. So this was developed at the University of Pennsylvania under contract from the U.S. Army. It was designed to calculate artillery firing tables for the, arm, the Army, so they wanted to know if I'm going to shoot an artillery um, what what angle, you know, based on the humidity outside, based on the elevation I'm at, you know, based on the weight of the mortar that I'm trying to fire, what angle do I have to put it at, how much gunpowder do I have to put in there, you know, that kind of stuff. And this machine was so fast that it could calculate a trajectory. It took it 30 seconds to calculate the trajectory. And to do that same math by hand would have taken a human 20 years. Or a hundred humans, you know, I guess two-tenths of a year, right? A, a few months. However, in order to program it to do so, it took them a week to figure out how to put the program in a way that the computer could execute it. And then once they had the program pretty sure they got it figured out, th they would have to move these cables around and unplug them and replug them to sort of change the order of the instructions. And that took several days, like several days of constant work just to get it programmed to do a new thing. So basically they would set up a program and then they would run that same program a whole bunch of times with lots of different parameters. And then they would figure out a new program and reset it again and do that kind of thing. So this was what I was taught when I was in school was the first general purpose electronic computer. Another thing that I'd like to say about this image is that these women who are standing in the, in the photo, these were the programmers. So in, in these days, in the 1940s and all the way up until basically the 1970s, the majority of computer programmers were women. And uh, it's a super interesting story and maybe a topic for a future video about how it happened that um, programming became considered to be an, a male-dominated profession rather than a female-dominated profession. Um, but So this was ENIAC. Uh, it was pretty big. It was uh, about 1,800 square feet, so it took... Uh, it, was, it would fit in a tennis court, a standard tennis pitch, um, but it would fill up most of it, right? More than half. All right, so that's ENIAC. So as you can imagine, Physically plugging everything around got pretty tiring, so after a few years of that, they said, man, we've got some ideas that can make this a lot better. And so that brings us to the EDVAC, which was developed by the same team at the University of Pennsylvania, again, under contract from the U.S. Army. This was much smaller, and it was uh, much cheaper as well. Instead of a half million dollars, this was only about $200,000 to produce. So unlike ENIAC, the EDVAC machine here used binary, so instead of the numbers going from 0 to 9 in each place value, they were just 0 and 1, which made it a lot easier for the computer to do the calculations. Um, and secondly, the major, major, major invention here was that it was able to store the computer programs in the same computer memory that held the data. And which is what's called now called the von Neumann architecture because he was the the mathematician who wrote down this idea that of of this uh, this combined structure. And uh, and that made the computer much easier to program, much easier to work uh, 
and it could be switched around as far as which task it could do um, much more quickly. So that's it, right? You've got a machine that can store a program and execute it without tedious manual intervention, and we're basically done, right? The machines we use today are basically the same as the EDVAC in the, in the sense that they use binary, that they store their programs. Like, there's been no fundamental mechanical change in the way computers have worked. We've just made them much, much smaller and much, much faster. So that's where we're going to stop here. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like. Uh, please consider subscribing. Uh, also, if there's something that I got wrong in here or something that you think I should cover in another video, or if you have any questions, throw it down in the comments below and uh, maybe I'll make a video about it in the future or, or stuff like that. So, okay. Thanks for listening and I will see you in the next one.